Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining. My name is Kellen Betts. I'm a course lead in the MITx MicroMasters Supply Chain Management Program, and I'm involved in sustainability research here at the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. Our current MITx courses, which I know many of you are part of, are supply chain technology and systems and supply chain design. So welcome learners. I hope you find today's event a great addition to your experience in these courses. Before we get started, I want to make one announcement for SC4X, our learners in SC4X. Today is a deadline to verify for the course. So if you're considering going for a certificate, make sure you register today. And there's still time to do so today. This is a deadline that we can't change. So please make sure to register today if you're interested in going for that certificate. And with that, let's get started. So today we are fortunate to have two expert panelists in the use of data optimization, machine learning and supply chain. Very excited to be your hosts for today's event. And so let's welcome Shifeng Wang and Rao Pan Chalavarapu. If you guys might turn on your cameras and audio, please. Hello, everyone. Hey, Kelly. Thanks for having me here. This is Hello, Chifeng. everyone. Awesome. So before we get started and do introductions and discussion, let's kick off the event with a quick poll. We'd love to learn more about the audience and why you're here today. So let me just launch that poll here. There we go. So why are you here today? A um, number of different options. I'll let you take a few minutes to, to take a look and we'd love to hear your input. Why are you here today? I want to learn about data and ML. Um, I want to learn about these topics more specific to retail supply chains. Um, so I'll give you a few minutes to um, um, fill out our poll. Great, thank you. And so um, while you do so, I'm all, um, spend a, a talk a little bit about our agenda for today. So for the next few minutes, I'll have our panelists introduce themselves and provide a little background and what they do and how it relates to the topic today. I'll then ask some questions we have pre-prepared. And in the last 15 minutes for the event will be saved for your questions. Please use the webinar Q&A. It's the little button on the bottom, the Q&A button on the bottom to ask questions. And be sure you're logged in with a, user, a name. I won't read anonymous questions. And I'll also share a couple more, more polls during the event. So be prepared to participate. So first, let's check in on our poll here and, and look at the results. So it looks like... It looks like the majority want to see um, how data and ML can um, improve supply chain performance. That's very interesting. Also, just generally expanding their supply chain knowledge. Um, you know, it looks like everyone is interested in mo most of these different topics. That's great. Awesome to see some MicroMasters SCM students who don't miss any events on here. That's awesome. And we'd love to hear from you in the, the chat on the left hand or the chat button on the bottom. Um, please introduce yourself if you'd like. And again, you please use that Q&A feature if you have any questions as we go along. And so with that, let's get started. Um, so Shifeng, can you introduce yourself um, and share a little bit about your background? Uh, thanks, Kellen. Hey, uh, everyone, uh, Shifeng, uh, last name Wang. Uh, I lead operations research team uh, at GameStop. Uh, so my area focus on transportation fulfillment, SOP and procurement. So uh, anything you name uh, relates to supply chain. So my role here, I'm seven months here uh, with uh, GameStop. Uh, I have three major uh, tasks here to solve. Number one is to build data set and the KPIs to monitor and evaluate the system to understand the trade-off uh, between different systems. And I also help uh, the senior leadership to design the supply chain network. Uh, so we have two business ones, e-commerce, otherwise uh, uh, retail stores. So for e-commerce, they have to help the uh, business to reduce uh, this order to deliver, improve consolidation, which you will hear a lot for e-commerce uh, business. So for the retail, I help the business to uh, optimize the replenish network, uh, drive down out of stock. Uh, last thing, I help uh, the businesses to uh, uh, optimize the existing system and build uh, new algorithms for the future. Uh, that's a little background. Awesome. Thank you, Shufang. So happy to have you joining the discussion today. You know, GameStop is a, is a company that's been in the news um, a lot this last year or so. And so um, also a very exciting omnichain retail that's going through some transformation. And so looking forward to hearing about your experience um, I mean, using data and, and modeling and simula simulation and optimization. So awesome. Thank you for joining. Um, and then so then, um, Rao, could you introduce yourself and share a little bit about your background as well? Sure, sure, certainly. <clears throat> Thanks, Kellen. And my name is Rao Panchalavarapur. I'm working at uh, Walmart as principal data scientist. 
And in my role as principal data scientist, I'm responsible for developing a variety of optimization models, which involve various strategic, tactical, and operational decisions for the company. And prior to joining Walmart, I was there at various other companies like Amazon, Starbucks, uh, Nordstrom. And most of my work, work experience was with a company in Green Bay, Wisconsin, Snyder Logistics. And there I had an opportunity to work with a variety of uh, customers of Snyder, which includes General Motors, Ford, and you know, a wide range of uh, companies like Whirlpool. And uh, in that role, I was primarily responsible for developing supply chain optimization models, which involve uh, decisions like where to locate facilities and which uh, customers should be uh, getting their freight from which location and things like that. Um, so that uh, work experience has given me a lot of opportunities to work with a variety of shippers all over the world, uh, which includes uh, uh, Asia mostly, and also working in uh, Latin America a lot. And uh, of course, North America, we had lots of customers. Uh, so that has given me a lot of opportunities to really understand how global supply chains work. And uh, as part of my work, I also engage myself with some kind of research with other academic institutes. And that's what I've been doing over the years. Uh, uh, that's a uh, high level about myself. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll be able to answer later, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, Raoul. Thank you for joining. I'm very, sure. um, lots of experience um, in this area and looking forward to um, hearing your discussion on data and some of your experience in simulation and optimization. So awesome. Um, thank you. So let's let's launch into some pre-prepared questions we have. Um, and so building off your introductions, before we dive into kind of specific questions about data machine learning, I want to start with a more broad question. Um, and starting with you, Rao, um, what has been your experience and what do you see for the role for data and supply chain strategy, um, supply chain design and supply chain operations? Just kind of a broad question. I don't know if you have kind of thoughts on that um, kind of broad, broad area. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. I think uh, data, I mean, let's, uh, let's go item by item here. I think we are talking about strategy, we are talking about data, we are talking about, you know, impacting, creating impact for the business overall. So <clears throat> talking about data, I think data is very critical. And nowadays, you know, with all the, with all the explosion in uh, developments in uh, software and hardware, and, you know, there's no problem to get data. But I think the issue is how do we really take advantage of that? And how do we really effectively integrate with our processes within the company and, uh, and also you know not all data is created equal so there is some parts of the data which is which doesn't make sense at all because some process something might have gone wrong somewhere so it is important to really collect what is going on across the company in any format uh, that is acceptable within the organization but on top of it it is also important to make sure that we are collecting a as accurate as possible. You know, for example, if you are moving a load from Seattle to New York, and if somebody tells me it costs $5 to do that, not per mile, I'm talking about for the entire load. And there is some problem with the data. So it is important to really make sure that we are collecting right pieces of information also as accurately as possible. So that is part A of the whole story. Then part B of the story, is then how we are really taking advantage of this piece of information which we have available for, within the company or within our uh, uh, business process. Uh, so to answer that question, you know, there are a variety of things we could do nowadays. And uh, again, uh, thanks to all the developments in the data, I mean, all the hardware developments as well as software developments. Uh, I want to give you one example to the team here. And I have been working on this optimization space close to 25 years. And when I started my first job, to answer a business question like where to open a facility, and you really cannot solve the problem unless you have a heuristic procedure or some kind of uh, uh, some kind of software which really takes into consideration all these um, optimization methods and other things. But you know, late '90s, with all the developments in Ample, Cplex, of course, nowadays Groovy is the talk of the town, and there have been lots of developments, and also the ability to solve these large-scale optimization problems has become more practical and meaningful compared to well, mid 80s and early 90s and all that stuff. So when I joined my first job, I really couldn't solve anything more than something like 100 location, 100 node network or something like that to get a best location uh, solution to the company. But nowadays, you know, I mean, I, if I have a million nodes and uh, if I have to construct, a, I mean, not million nodes, sorry, if I have 1,000 nodes and if I have to construct a network with million lanes, uh, 
to solve that kind of optimization problem in the real world sense has become much, much easier. And what it was taking like two hours and sometimes I was running over the weekend is possible to solve in a matter of few minutes and uh, if not in seconds. So, so the central point here is to answer uh, Kellen's question. Yes, we do. We need quality. Data. We need data in the first place. And then we need to make sure the data is quality and usable uh, for the business. And the next and the third step is how do we really take advantage of this data? And with all the developments in uh, computer science and the hardware, which, you know, hardware developments, it is really possible to solve a large scale optimization model in much more quicker time in many cases in real time. And uh, I will leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, Raya. Lots of great insights to unpack yep, there. I'm yep. sure we can dive into a lot of those details, like some of the tools you mentioned, you know, Jerobi and um, data quality, I know is a critical issue. And so I know I'll have some um, opportunity to discuss that hopefully today as well as um, the advances in computer um, hardware side of things and how that um, facilitates, I guess, um, new approaches to problems. That's awesome. Um, so Shifang, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that same question, if you want to just maybe um, build on any of Raoul's comments. Yeah, so uh, so for me, I read this on news. I think uh, data is the new uh, oil, the crude oil, mm -hmm. and the supply chain is like a complex machine. We can run a machine with, without oil because we can uh, use electricity. But uh, uh, data, we have to ext extract uh, lubricant uh, from the oil to optimize our system. So uh, with all the operational strategy, operational decision, uh, we need data to monitor if we're doing the right thing. And for the long-term strategy, we have to build on all top of uh, 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 optimization uh, simulation model to understand if we make some change ABC, what is the impact to our business? So uh, with all the data we have, uh, tons of data we have, we can look at all the detail, like on all nodes of the supply chain system to understand what the bottleneck is, right? where should we increase capacity? And uh, uh, if something will happen from prediction, and then we can do some backup plans, especially for the holiday planning. The volume is three, four times more than uh, the regular season. So we need this data to simulate. Uh, if we pull some trigger in the system, let's say in transportation fulfillment, uh, uh, fulfillment centers, what's the impact? And we need this data uh, from analysis, optimization, simulation to give uh, business leaders uh, uh, a good understanding of how to shape the gear. Yeah, those are great insights as well, Xufang. And I love the analogy, or I guess the, I guess it's an analogy of, of data as the new oil. I think I've heard that a few times as well. And, um, and the value of data, obviously, um, especially in supply chains and making supply chains run and, and lubricating supply chains. That's very interesting. I love that. Um, awesome. Um, so maybe, I know you touched on this a little bit, Rao, as well, um, but maybe if you could um, build on a little bit more on how the role for data, you over your career, how you see the role of, uh, for data has evolved over your career. So you mentioned how kind of the hardware side has facilitated new approaches to problems, you know, bigger optimization problems. Um, do, you, do you have any other thoughts on how yeah, that's evolved? Yeah, yeah, sure, career? sure. I can, I can definitely take a stab at it. And, uh, you know, basically when I started more than 20 years back, our ability to really handle data in those days, I'm talking about the late 90s to early 2000s, our ability to really handle something like more than a million rows uh, is somewhat considered, I mean, because CSV in those days is something like even lower than what we have. I mean, I'm talking about Microsoft Excel CSV. And we used to use things like Access. Of course, we do have some Microsoft products in those days to handle large scale databases. But I think anything running into few millions was considered as a very, very kind of hard thing to really handle. And now I think if I'm in, mean, just, I don't want to really talk about the complete, complete evolution, but I think uh, if I look at today, and if I had get a 50 million rows or something like 100 million rows is no big deal, actually. <laughs> In fact, I have handled more than 500 million and 600 million rows of data and getting, getting insight into that kind of large data spaces and also using that kind of large databases uh, to create inputs to the optimization model has become relatively easier with all, you know, uh, all the tools we have, we are using more of Python and all these kind of tools now compared to 25 years back. Uh, I would say, I think uh, the ability to handle large scale data has become very, pos very possible in the real world. 
on top of it, you know, with all this uh, developments in the hardware, we are collecting more and more data compared to what we were able to collect in those days. So that is also helping us to really capture uh, specific aspects that are going within the supply chain and also get to the bottom of what is really causing some specific issue, whatever it is. Uh, overall, I think uh, the summary here is, I think our ability to collect, process, and analyze data has become significantly, uh, in, has increased significantly from just a um, few millions to hundreds of millions of rows of data. Yeah, that's very interesting insight. Mm. Um, you, know, you often hear about like, you know, high performance, large, you know, big data, um, database and technologies. But we also, I, I, I don't often hear about the technologies that facilitate the collection of data, because um, obviously that data has to come from somewhere. And so that pipeline is being filled by um, a whole mm -hmm. upstream piece, which is interesting. And hopefully maybe we can um, touch on that. Um, Shifang, I don't know if you had any thoughts on you know, the evolution of, of data and your role um, over your career. Yeah, so uh, totally echo uh, Ross uh, response on the speed and volume uh, of the current big data set, uh, big data environment. Because I remember a couple of years ago when I started, we used the SQL system and take me hours, days, or even weekends to run uh, a month of uh, custom order data for simulation. So now always we use uh, uh, either Google or uh, Microsoft. It takes me uh, minutes to get a results. So I can answer the question very quickly to my leadership instead of having them wait for a week or a couple of days. And then I figure out, oh, there's a bug over here. So now my response rate is much more uh, faster. Uh, but uh, sometimes I have to deal with the uh, data issue like uh, bad data or garbage data because garbage in, garbage out, right? And sometimes we don't have enough data to support analysis. So some of the challenge I would call out uh, in this field is number one, the connectivity between uh, different systems. Uh, like, uh, uh, so for example, we are a team of data scientists working collaborate. collaborate. So I have to uh, uh, output some of my analysis to my downstream partner, they have to do analysis. So there, for example, if I uh, dump my data to the transportation team, I have to work with them very um, uh, closely to help them to smooth their work, like I'll put the data to their, the format they need, right? Uh, uh, that's the first thing, the connectiv connectivity between different process uh, in a business. And number two is uh, deal with like the missing data because lots of time, if we have to deal with uh, third party data, they don't have a good data inf infrastructure. For example, uh, 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 consolidation centers uh, from a third party, that's very hard. So sometimes we have to uh, uh, estimate the data to support our analysis. So these are two additions. That's very interesting. Um... Interesting insights. Connectivity is a, I think a critical piece um, that we don't often talk about. Um, and maybe kind of building off that idea, also, so, you know, some of your comments about the evolution, um, and maybe connecting it to what we're um, learning in supply chain technology and systems. Um, we talk about kind of a workflow for data-related projects. Um, so the specific framework we talk about is called the CRISP, um, and the basic idea is pretty simple. You know, you start with understanding the business and data, and you prepare the data, then you do modeling, and then you evaluate the model. And there's obviously lots of um, feedbacks um, where you might you know, be starting from the beginning or going back to different steps, um, and then finally deploy. Um, so maybe Rao, again, starting with you, if you could share a little bit about your experience um, with kind of the workflow of data related projects and how it touches on some of these different aspects of cleaning data um, that you mentioned and, and you know, big data and, and those, those type of pieces. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I mean, I don't uh, engage myself a whole lot on the workflow, but I can talk at a high level. And we have other teams within the company who are actually really working on a day-to-day -day basis. But basically, you know, the whole process is pretty straightforward and simple. We have to collect data at some point uh, in the supply chain we based on, you know, there are multiple points actually, not <laughs> some point. Depending on the facilities, you know, we have hundreds of facilities within the network. So each facility is responsible for really capturing what is happening. And we have to integrate all these things at a central place. And after that, the real key thing is, are we really capturing right pieces of information? This is a continuous process. The one which I'm talking here is not a one-shot, one-time process. And we realize there are some issues with the data and all the stuff that, I mean, basically once we collect all this thing, we are doing this processing portion of it just to understand if there are any major issues within the data set which we are collecting, if we needed to change the processes so that we will capture more accurately. 
Uh, for example, you know, I, I mean, I can't give you the very specific example, but at a macro level, uh, when we really bring a trailer to a door, and uh, at what time we are opening, our, I mean, are we really making sure that uh, the person who is there at the trailer door is really capturing the time at which they are opening the door and capturing the time at which they are closing the door? That becomes extremely important because that will tell us to some extent, if not is the one, if not if that is not the only source, what is the time taken for the trailer to unload? So if we are not creating a process there to force the person who is working there to uh, when they are opening the trailer door versus closing the trailer door, you know, uh, that would that would really result in a, a kind of uh, inaccurate data set. For example, you know, somebody may choose not to really log in that time. And somebody may choose to log in that time after some three hours after they did that. So that would naturally provide wrong piece of information saying it took long time to really unload that trailer. So we need to put checks and balances in all the processes and all the stages within the supply chain just to make sure that we are collecting these pieces of information accurately. And once we get there, then we will go through the process of really evaluating and understanding are we collecting uh, right pieces of data? Of course, that is another strategic level question, but on top of it, are we collecting it as accurately as possible? Just like the example which I gave you, that is the next phase of it. Then I think at that point in time, once this process are done and once this database is completely made available to the teams like uh, data scientists and other analysts within the company, then they realize that there are some issues what they are finding. And then the feedback mechanism goes back and this is a continuous process where we have to really improve upon on a continuous basis. There's no one shot or one time solution to this whole process. Right? Yeah, very interesting insights. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the data capture, um, I, lo I love your example of the trailer door and when that uh, specific data point is captured based on just kind of a human um, operating process. It's very interesting insights. And Shifang, I don't know if you had any other thoughts on kind of the workflow um, of data and data related projects. Yeah, for sure. So. Uh... So uh, for the modern companies, the BI team, data team is not small. Like I think for any company, because uh, every team across business, like merchandising, transportation, fulfillment, they all need tons of data. So always, uh, if the request is very small, it's not, it will be on the backlog forever. So if I have some good relationship with a developer, I can get some source data. So first, uh, because the data is too much, uh, and uh, I usually have to prioritize what data I need to deliver this to the BI team, to have them to build a table for me or grab it from a source table. So always uh, when I get a request uh, from my manager, it's not well-defined. So for example, my manager asked me, uh, can we reduce our outbound cost? So there are different angles you can solve this problem, right? You can uh, do this from a reduced package, package count, reduced split, or a reduced OD pair distance, origin destination. So uh, when I start, I always uh, take a look, what data do I have? And what KPI can I use this data to generate, to define what is good, what is bad, uh, what is the trade-off. So as long as I have the data available uh, and then uh, do some validation cleanup, uh, that, that's the process uh, of, of my day. And then I do some uh, uh, data cleanup, uh, build some hypothesis, because uh, uh, it's always this type of what if question. What if we do A, B, C? Uh, what's the impact to the business downstream, upstream? So uh, I always have some uh, hypothesis. And then uh, once I have a perfect data, so most of the time it's not perfect. And then I, I build some model, uh, uh, either it's a prediction or an optimization model. And then uh, I will run some simulation, like a unit level simulation that will involve into a very huge data set. Like usually it's one year or two years of uh, custom order data to capture uh, the shape of business, like the product size, uh, customer order behavior shape. So we ran this simulation and used the uh, big data to understand. Uh, it's, it's similar like uh, to set up uh, uh, the operational KPI by using uh, the new algorithm. And then we understand here's the bottleneck operational challenges, uh, trade-offs between each business unit. Because sometimes if we optimize a KPI, sometimes it will uh, uh, make the other KPI worse. So you have to understand what's the how to pull a lever, right? Do we uh, benefit one process, but maybe sacrifice another one? And then once we have this holistic view of uh, simulation results, 
uh, all different components of the supply chain process, uh, we help the leaders to bring here is all the KPIs uh, based on my uh, simulation results from all the data and then uh, uh, make a decision. That's it. It's really long. Yeah, those are great insights. That sounds like very much the, the a similar framework and we'll be discussing class. That's awesome. And so I want to maybe I'm dive into a couple of other details. But before we do, I want to launch our second poll here. So let me just load that up. And it's a historical data historical trivia um, poll. Um, and so the question is, um, which one of these statements is true? And so I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on on history of data and machine learning and which one of these um, different options is true. And while we um, give you a few minutes to um, take a look at that poll, I'll maybe I'll go into the next question. Um, so there are many tools. I know you've mentioned actually uh, several, you know, Jerobi and SQL and some of these others um, as uh, the discussion has evolved. So there's many different tools um, that are available for the life cycle of data from extraction and cleaning, preparation um, and loading and then, a mo and then modeling. Um, and there's commercial off the shelf packages as well as, you know, open source software like Python, I think you mentioned in R. Um, and so my question is, um, how have you approached this kind of, you know, complex ecosystem of lots of different tools, you know, tools that are commercial, tools that are open source? Um, how do you approach this just from your career perspective? You know, do you try to learn all the different tools um, and then, you know, just adapt to your company? Or do you try to focus on maybe one, like focus, just pick Python and focus on one and become an expert in Python? Um, and so, Rao, how have you kind of approached this, um, you call this problem of the many different tools available over your career? Sure, sure. So, great question, Kellen. Uh, you know, I would, I would answer this this way. If you are talking about, uh, let's stick to the optimization tools first. I think if we are talking about optimization tools, we have a variety of products in the industry. Of course, Groovy is the state of the art. We do have Ample. We do, of course, Ample to really, the front end to really create the model and all the stuff. Uh, all the stuff and also the Cplex, of course, Cplex and Groovy, they have primarily the same functionality, but the ability of Groovy is much more, uh, ability to solve large scale op optimization problems in reasonable time is far better than uh, Cplex with all the developments they have installed in the recent days. So to answer your question, within the optimization space, I mean, I really don't have to really update my skill set or anything like that because the core of this whole thing is optimization background. Once somebody has a good understanding of how an optimization model works in the real life environment in the industry, then whether you move from Ample to something else or maybe Python as the interface and call Groovy within Python or do something else, all these things are a matter of, you know, few hours and a few days here and there to really learn. There's nothing significant to really worry about that there. So the key here is understanding the core concepts around an optimization process or optimization methodology and being able to be in a position to apply those skills into the industry and this coding and skills and tools, they come as a byproduct to it. But on the other hand, you know, to answer your question at a different level, if somebody is asked to really create a traditional C++ program to solve this simplex model from scratch, that requires a different kind of skill set. And not everybody in the optimization space will be able to really put their head around. And there is a set of people who are very much into the modeling and analysis. And of course, they can handle Python and all this stuff. And of course, any other tool around that. But if you have to really create your branch and bond algorithm from scratch, and then write C++ or C, B, C or Java based or whatever, that requires more programmatic and skills related issue. But in the business world, what happens is, we are in an environment where we are quickly turning out results and we are taking advantage of all this commercially available software like Cplex, Groovy and all this stuff. So I'm not engaging myself on a day-to-day -day basis to really write a branch and bond algorithm or develop a new heuristic around this. And that's, that happens more in the academic community and research community. But in the industry, uh, we are not really going into those domains because if I spend my time on those issues, my boss will tell me this is not going to be productive to the company when there is something available <laughs> in the industry. Why do you want to really create a branch and bond algorithm from scratch? So there in the industry, I think the issues are different here. So again, to answer your broader question in terms of the tools that are coming up, yes, I think uh, we are seeing an evolution on the tools and all the stuff, but when it comes to simulation, optimization, all this, thing, all this kind of tools, they don't really bother me. And even if something new comes, I think it's a matter of a, sometimes it's a, as fast as one or two days, and sometimes it could be one or two weeks uh, to get onto it. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, there is a new tool that it needs to be learned. I think we always need to make that effort because if that is what is the talk of the town, for example, and I'll tell you my own case. So I was not using Python before coming to Amazon and other places. And in fact, uh, halfway through my career in Green Bay. So in those days, the tool set was different, but we quickly learned everybody around me is using Python. And I think it's important to really use Python. So more than 15 years back or 10 years back, I think, uh, transition to Python. So there are some trends which are really important and people need to keep track of it. And if I want to continue to live in my world world, I won't be able to solve large scale problems if I don't really, if I want to really take advantage of this 500 million role database and all the things which I mentioned earlier, I need to be in a position to really use other tools rather than really sticking to my CSC file. Okay. <laughs> yeah, those are great insights. Um, okay. as, you know, especially definitely aligns with um, our perspective here in MITx and supply chain management and micromasters program, where that foundational knowledge is so important. Um, and then also just that continuous learning um, to be able to adapt to you know the the continuous evolution of new tools and technologies that come around. Uh, Shifang, before we get into the results for our poll, Shifang, do you have any thoughts on? Um, this um, topic of, you know, just the diversity of tools and becoming an expert in one versus um, the foundational knowledge in those those different areas. Yeah, uh, so echo uh, what Raul just uh, commented. So there are so many uh, softwares there on the market. They, they all do the same thing. It's all based on English, right? They just change the syntax. So uh, understand the background of the algorithm or the simulation model is very important because the key is not to learn some specific tool like Python or R, they're all the same, just change the syntax. So the key is to understand uh, how to translate the business ask into a model. So that's the key part. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, computation speed, uh, what system we use is, is always the same, right? Uh, I don't uh, require uh, some of my team members you have to use ABC. It's, it's all depends on what you prefer to. So I used to work with a Python environment for many years. And then uh, when I enter GameStop, I know that some people uh, they use R. It has a much better uh, data visualization. So I start to learn R. So uh, as long as you know the background of one, uh, uh, two, you should be do the switch over very quickly. Uh, you learn from uh, what you need. Yeah, those are great insights. Uh, that's awesome. Um, the foundational knowledge and then the adaptability to learning new tools, um, building off your, maybe your knowledge from one tool and trying to adapt that to a new tool. That's great, great insight. Uh, so let me share the poll here. Hopefully you can see it. So it looks like um, the majority or most um, thought that Arthur Samuel at IBM, who developed the min-max, uh, min-max algorithm for playing checkers, seems like most of you thought that was the most. And so this is actually a bit of a trick question that all these options were actually true. I'm a bit of a history buff. I love history in lots of different areas, and I found some interesting uh, yes, uh, history facts about data and machine learning that's very interesting. So, um, but again, trick question, these are all true. So, you know, maybe the first um, early, at least the earliest recorded instance of data analysis back in 1662, um, quite a long time ago, all the way evolving to now with, um, you know, big data and databases and Python and machine learning and neural networks and all the uh, technologies we have now. So, awesome. So with that, I might pivot the conversation a little bit from um, you know, to focus on data and go a little bit into um, some questions we have about uh, machine learning. And then we'll, again, we'll save that last 15 minutes of the, our session today for um, questions from you in the audience. And so please into those in the Q&A um, chat. I see there's several in there already, um, but please into those in the Q&A. Um, and so um, with the transition to the more machine learning kind of uh, focused topics, um, machine learning is obviously a powerful tool making predictions based on data. I know there are many applications in um, supply chain before diving into kind of details of machine learning. And I know that mo both of you focus also in simulation and optimization as well. Um, but I wanted to start with just kind of a broad question um, on if you have any, if you have any experience or you have there are like one or two different applications of machine learning in supply chain. And then maybe this time starting with you, Shifang, uh, I think demand forecasting, this is very important for all business. So, so almost every uh, business unit they use, like finance, they use it for uh, the company guideline and procurement, right? They need it to buy uh, enough quantity, but they don't, instead of uh, buying too much and sitting there forever. And uh, uh, like all bound transportation team needed to estimate what is my uh, volume looks like during peak, because I can negotiate a better rate uh, with the carrier and the fulfillment team need the volume forecast for uh, labor planning and storage. So each team uh, 
for the demand forecasting, they are uh, forecasting different granular outputs, like some just to focus on the overall units flow uh, to use it for labor planning, some to forecast the cubic flow to design the capacity, right? And, uh, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's very challenging area uh, for demand forecasting. So we usually tailor uh, different models for different needs and some business units, they can tolerate a, a higher over forecast. So for example, if uh, I have a demand forecasting to give a procurement a, a guideline, like how many units on this skill I have to buy. Uh, so uh, forecasting, demand forecasting is one thing. The other thing is how we execute this. Like if I tell the procurement team to say buy 10 of these units, but the minimum uh, case pack quantity is 20, I have to round up, right? You have to consider everything uh, execution level, but uh, demand forecasting is is a, is what I am super interested. In. Yeah, no, that's definitely a, a, a critical problem. Forecasting is a very interesting area as well. And I know I probably actually may want to try to dive into some of the details there as well. But maybe Rao, if you had any thoughts on yeah, one, sure. or, one or two applications that you find interesting in spite Absolutely, I think I completely agree with you, Fang. And the, the demand forecasting is one of the important aspects for any organization. We are talking about forecasting variety of things, whether you're talking about forecasting labor, forecasting demand on products and forecasting on wide range of things uh, that happens in a company. Uh, so that fits into what's called, I think, if you go back to the theoretical arena for a minute, that fits into what's called supervised learning and uh, regression analysis and all those things will fit into that. Yeah. But let's focus for a minute on the other side, that is unsupervised uh, learning. So basically what happens is uh, if you don't have labeled data, then you get into that kind of issue. But we end up using this uh, uh, clustering approach, which fits into this unsupervised learning umbrella. So we use that clustering approach to really cluster products. For example, you know, if I'm engaged in this large scale network optimization study, and every company will have hundreds of thousands of uh, products and all this stuff. So how do we really group these products into meaningful number of uh, uh, product groups so that we can use this, those product groups as an input to the optimization model? And we end up doing the cluster analysis a lot. And uh, that is another application on top of what uh, we earlier talked about. Yeah, those are both great examples. So demand forecasting and also unsupervised um, learning example of clustering um, in supply chain technology and systems, we're studying that right now, the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. Those are great examples. Um, and so maybe building off of kind of both of your comments on both of those examples, how do you see how machine learning fits into kind of the broader um, approach? You know, both of you specialize in also optimization and simulation as well. How does machine learning fit into those type of projects? You know, obviously demand forecast is going to be critical for those projects. Um, so Shifang, maybe how, how do you see the demand forecasting fit into the broader um, you know, projects that you're involved in with optimization and simulation and some of the others? Yeah, so uh, uh, I have been involved into uh, different types of uh, demand forecasting. So uh, it's, it's all the demand forecasting model has to be uh, tailored according to the uh, business pattern, like the sales pattern. So the GameStop uh, I work here is very different than uh, the traditional e-commerce company because uh, the problem we have is always a uh, limitation on uh, uh, the inventory. So we cannot guarantee enough inventory. So for example, PS5, a PS4, a PS5, or Xbox, the new one. So, for this case, uh, the demand forecasting is not very important because uh, it doesn't matter how many we buy, we, we can always sell it. So it's very different. So uh, for uh, so how to fit uh, this into a business uh, question is that uh, previously we use a supervised model to forecast the demand, but the problem is if there's a new launch, like a new game, right? Uh, there's no pattern historical pattern on it. So we couldn't forecast very accurately. Uh, even, even on a uh, total units uh, a scale, like we forecast the company level units sold. If there is a big launch, like a new game, a new system, we cannot capture it. But if we use the unsupervised model, then we lose the historical uh, information to, to better predict uh, the data. So it's very, so it's depending on how we solve the problem and what the problem is. So one, uh, interesting project we used to have is uh, we have a, a demand forecasting project at skill level to place inventory. So a team member uh, of us, uh, not myself, he was able to translate this model uh, problem into a, a very simple one uh, to use the Excel uh, to solve the model because um, we 
because of the variability of the demand, we couldn't accurately forecast the model. So then uh, the guy was trying to say, let's find a very easy way uh, uh, estimate the demand, which the business can accept. Yeah, that's it. That's a very interesting example for sure. Um, I know we're, we're running up to our time here on um, our 15 minutes. And so I maybe Rao, if you have any other thoughts on how uh, machine yeah. learning fits into the broader um, you know, projects and sure. approaches. Sure, definitely a great question, Kelly. And I think uh, machine learning certainly fits into many of the initiatives in a business environment. Uh, let's talk about one simple, like, I'll try to really finish this in two minutes. I, I see that we are running into time crunch probably. So basically, you know, let's talk about uh, a very simple problem where you have to really determine where to open new warehouses for a company. Then the question of really getting into the forecasts associated with products and all these things will come into play. On top of it, you know, you also needed to really take into consideration the, what product groups the company is making, what products the company is making, and how do we really group them into related buckets and all this stuff. So when we are talking about a large scale supply chain optimization model, the inputs to that model will come from a machine learning model. Machine learning model essentially helps us to forecast what kind of demand you would anticipate in the next uh, one year, six months, or maybe in some impact when we talk about network design studies, we should be able to really think through as far as five years, because you are making these strategic decisions for the company, you really don't want to limit to the forecast for the next six months or one year. So forecasting and supervised learning methods, which we talked about in you know, all this regression and also they really play a vital role and they are the key inputs, the output from those models are the key inputs to any kind of optimization model. But more importantly, as I said, the clustering also will help us. That is another uh, machine learning model we are talking about. The clustering will help us to really group all these products, group all these products into a meaningful number and do all this analysis outside and feed that into the model, which I, which I mentioned earlier. And in addition to this, you know, machine learning models are really helpful to understand. I'll give you another simple example, how customers are really ordering products. And uh, can we really, or uh, when, when somebody orders milk, are they ordering butter and bread? And, you know, because if in, in the e-commerce environment, what happens is uh, what constitutes a package, what is there in the package will determine the size or, into, or the weight and also the eventual transportation costs associated with that. Um, so in order to get to the bottom of this kind of analysis, we can use clustering and other machine learning models there. Yeah, those are great insights, mm -hmm. um, especially the concept of you know, machine learning prediction as a key input to like an optimization model. It's, it's awesome. Yes. Awesome. So before we um, launch into um, some questions from you and the audience, I wanted to launch our, our third poll here. So let me just load that up. So our third poll, we'd love to um, hear your, your thoughts on what was the most interesting part of the session today. Um, and while we while I give you a chance to um, answer that poll, I'm gonna pick a few questions here from the Q&A. Um, and so it looks like, this is actually a great question from Farhan. Um, and maybe I'll start with you, Shifong, if we could. Um, you know, data quality is obviously a critical area. And so his question is what techniques um, are used um, to kind of to clean you know, low quality polluted historical data. Do you have any um, thoughts on techniques that are used to clean data? Uh, so th there's no specific technique. So set up a KPI, use your data. So from a uh, daily operations, uh, from that KPI, you will see if there's a data error. Usually when we launch a new program, we use the KPI to monitor. Is this a system issue or do we capture the wrong data? Yeah, use KPI, key metrics. That's very interesting insight. So it's kind of starting from the end and working backwards to identify um, issues downstream or upstream, I guess. Um, interesting, you know, Rao, do you have any other thoughts on what techniques um, you have experience with to clean data? Yeah. You know, we, I mean, I ended up using some commercially available tools. I don't have the names on top of my head, but uh, Python is a better tool to really analyze and understand what are the issues in the data. I mean, I'll give you one of the simplest example which anybody will be able to see. In US, we do have, this five-digit Jeep code, but when you go to Vermont and uh, other northeastern states, they start with zero. And if we really call that field as a number, the zero is taken away. And that results in a <laughs> Jeep, which is invalid. So cleaning that kind of things is very straightforward. So, you know, the bottom, the important point I'm trying to make here is uh, you need to have knowledge and understanding behind the process, uh, behind the data which you are using. And if you don't have that, you cannot really bring a commercially available tool 
and try to really clean your data set. For example, if the tool doesn't realize that uh, US has this kind of five digit chips where the first digit could be zero in some cases, there's no way anybody could help. So I have seen the, some commercially available tools not satisfying our requirements in the past. So as a result, you know, my understanding and belief based on whatever I worked in the last several years is we need to have a complete understanding on the process data behind. Suppose if somebody is giving me the transportation cost to move a, a package from uh, Seattle to New York is only 50 cents. And that tells me there's something wrong with the data. So if somebody is not familiar with US transportation network and costs associated with that, they may buy that timber and then they may use that in their analysis. So the key point I'm trying to make here is you need to be knowledgeable about the business. You need to be knowledgeable about the process. You need to be knowledgeable about the geography and all the stuff. I'll throw another simple example. And long time back, I was given a supply chain network optimization study in India. And uh, I know the geography in India very well and all the stuff there easily. Then uh, they gave me a location saying, this is what it is coming from. In reality, the data is pointing to somewhat a different location. And uh, there is a problem with the geocoding part of the data. And that is what is causing that. And uh, if you are knowledgeable about the geography, if you are knowledgeable about your business process, if you are knowledgeable about other things, I think that helps in cleaning the data. And Python is the central tool which you could use to really do this. Yeah, that's great, Interesting, great insight. Um, and maybe the limitations on sometimes on technology and how critical that um, business knowledge and business intuition is to um, to solve or to, to help address um, issues with data quality. That's great insight. So let me close our poll here and share the results um, before we launch into our next question. Thank you for all for participating in our polls today. Um, it looks like um, many of you thought expanding my knowledge on data and supply chain, um, data and machine learning and supply chain, um, as well as understanding the impact of data and machine learning and supply chain functions. That's great. Um, and learning about some specific applications. That's great. So thank you for sharing, sharing your insight. So let me uh, pick another question here. It looks like we have a maybe an interesting question. I know COVID has you know, kind of a, been with us for quite a while now and an important topic. But um, so one question on COVID is supply chain. Um, let me actually pull this up here. I can't find the name, sorry. But um, supply chain was critical, um, affected by COVID-19. And so the question is, how do optimization models and data help organizations to recover from COVID-19? Um, and then kind of maybe building on that, um, how do you um, use the last two years of COVID impact um, to then maybe forecasting you know, future demand? Obviously the last two years have been a, quite a unique experience for all of us in a number of ways. Um, so, the, so two questions, you know, how, do you, how did you use optimization and machine learning and data um, to you know, solve and to adapt and to um, respond to COVID? And then how is that gonna impact going forward? Um, and so maybe um, Raul, start with you this time, if you have any sure, thoughts on that sure. question. Yeah. So COVID has come into discussions in our projects. And uh, to answer this question, you know, it is not going to change my optimization model. It's not going to change any basics that are associated with the machine learning model. But the key thing that it is going to change is how we are going to look at the demand forecast for the coming periods. For example, COVID might have spiked up demand for a particular product or might have completely eliminated demand for a particular product. So the, basically to answer your question in short, it is going to impact the way how we forecast demand for the products, but it, that output, whatever that comes anyway, is going to be the input to the optimization model. So the optimization part of the analysis is going to be pretty stable and pretty, pretty much the same. But what we are going to feed into this modeling process in terms of the future forecast, future demand, that is where it is going to have impact. And again, talking about the methodology associated with that, at least to the best of my knowledge, I haven't seen people running an entirely different kind of forecasting process, but I think it requires manual intervention sometimes. You know, man, the reason manual intervention is important is uh, if you really input to any kind of machine learning model saying, this is what I did in the last five years for this product, and it will tell us, okay, next year you are going to do this much. But that is not the case in the presence of COVID. Either the demand has gone up or gone down. And that is where a manual intervention is really helpful to really clean up the data. Whether you are talking about machine learning or optimization, at the end of the day, I think the role of any business person is to really make sure the solutions you are giving to the for execution and implementation should be going through one more pass of analysis, which requires a manual intervention, just to understand 
that we are giving something that is more practicable or practical to the company. Yeah, that's great insight. Um, the concept of me, human in the loop, um, you know, important. <laughs> our machine learning and algorithms um, are only so powerful and something like COVID, we might need that human in the loop again to, to help address that. That's great. So as you find, I don't know if you have any thoughts on how you use um, your machine learning or data and optimization to adapt to COVID, to respond to COVID or how it might impact going forward. So I fully agree with what Raul just mentioned. So uh, there is no change on the methodology modeling modeling itself. The data is the same, the model is the same, but there is a change, very big shift on the custom order behavior, like online orders three times more, and then your uh, retail store uh, order is, let's say, 50% less. So we have to adapt. It's a volume shift between different channels. Uh, using uh, the traditional model, it doesn't tell us uh, where the business will go. Uh, but uh, like what Ron mentioned, we have to use human human intervention, which is very important to get guidelines on the models. So with the COVID, we have a like a very bad shortage on labor right? in the DC, everywhere. We have a very big bottleneck in the supply chain, like transportation, uh, transportation capacity. So we have to better predict what is our volume, and we have to deliver this this number to the third party to help them to be to design their capacity. So. It, it uh, requires us to provide a uh, more accurate on uh, what the volume looks like, but it's more challenging. Yeah, yeah those are great insights. Um, definitely been a interesting two, uh, two years, and so having the human in the loop um, makes a lot of sense. And having that foundational knowledge and, and the experience in the business side of things to help address some of these challenges makes um, a lot of sense. And so maybe if we probably have time for one more question. So Edwin has a great question here. Um, which is you know, kind of talking about how data um, is seen from a leadership perspective. Um, and his question is how frequently um, you know, see, senior leadership asks for data support in operational decisions. And so maybe just kind of broadening that a little bit, you know, how do you translate some of your day-to-day -day, you know, work of you know, building the optimization model to you know, some of the strategic or, or goals um, that your senior leadership um, has? Um, and so maybe Xifeng, I don't know if you want to start out um, with your some thoughts on that question. Yeah. So uh, senior leadership every day they look at uh, weekly business review, a daily business review to track if the business is healthy. And then if uh, there's some uh, uh, KPI have a big change, then either it's operational mistake we made or uh, there's some data issue. So for the long-term strategy, uh, uh, we have to use the data to run simulation or optimization models to run different scenarios uh, like uh, what Rob did. So if I look at my facility in this location versus another location. So in terms of just location, there are different definitions, customer best location, uh, capacity best location, right? It's a labor cheaper, uh, the uh, uh, lease is much cheaper per square feet, or there's a transportation optimal location. So there are different uh, data we need to support the same analysis. But at the end of the day, uh, we have to bring all the data together to run like different scenarios to create uh, to mimic if we operate this way, these are the KPIs will look like. So we uh, provide very high, high uh, aggregate level of uh, operational KPIs. We, we don't just bring all the data to leadership. Yeah, that makes sense. You don't want to send them the, the SQL query or the database. You got to bring the insights, uh, very interesting perspective. So Raul, I don't know if you have any thoughts on kind of the leadership. Yeah, sure, sure. So when we interact with senior leadership, the thing I have noticed, I mean, most of my projects, you know, they fit into the strategic uh, network design kind of stuff. So I had several opportunities to work with senior leaders in various companies. Uh, so when I go ahead to and talking to a senior leader, my first step is to understand, does this guy has any kind of analytical optimization or any kind of background? If not, I think the responsibility lies on my head to translate, of course, even if the person is completely in the optimization space, uh, they may not have time to think on a day-to-day -day basis about this, uh, methodologies and the process which we use. So to, to give you a short answer here, I think it is important to make sure that we speak their language and give the answer to the uh, in, a, in a way that the business can really understand in plain, simple English terms rather than using super complex uh, technology, which is, I mean, I don't want to talk about branch and bond or simplex algorithm or something like that when I go <laughs> and sit in front of my senior leadership, even if it means that person has a PhD in operations research, I think that's not what it is. 
So to answer your question at a high level, I think it is important to make sure that we are staying focused and staying focused in relation to the business goals and translating everything what the model is doing in terms of plain, simple English rather than saying we did some sensitivity analysis. What is sensitivity analysis? That they get hung up there. <laughs> so instead of saying sensitivity analysis, I use the word. I change the numbers to the future demand or whatever, you know, however way you are running that sensitivity, you use that simple English rather than using the word sensitivity analysis. So the terminology and jargon which you use while interacting with senior leadership plays a vital role because if they don't understand your language, then they won't have any buy-in. You may have a very valid point and you may have a very valid set of numbers, uh, but it won't be convincing to them. So the communication is the key aspect there. I just want to add one point here. So, uh, we have to speak the language uh, the senior leadership speak because uh, I have a uh, experience when I first started I have a meeting with my CEO and then I bring a very complex model and then when I bring to that page some people they, they pull their cell phone they don't interest in it so uh, like when I get more experience I leave uh, all the models in dependency but I just generate these are the key matrices uh, for that model so speak their language is very important yeah, that's great insight. Speaking their language and translating those um, kind of complex details of data and the models um, to the, the language that they speak. That's that's great insight. Um, all right, well, I wish we had uh, more time. I know there's a ton of questions here in the Q&A, and I wish we had you know, another hour to, to go to all these questions, but we are all running up against the hour. Um, so I want to start um, by thanking our guests, um, Shifeng and Rao, for um, sharing your insight, sharing your experience and your knowledge today. I very much appreciate your time. And I also want to share my screen here briefly and just take a chance to mention, um, so this webinar is part of a series that we are um, doing here with the MIT MicroMasters Program in Supply Chain Management. And next week we have our second um, um, event in the series, um, the Changing Landscape of Omnichannel Retail um, Fulfillment um, next Wednesday. So I um, hope you all can join that one. Um, we will, I believe, hopefully we can, we'll put a link here. I'll just paste it right here into the chat function to register for that event. Um, I would encourage you to attend if you have a chance. Um, and then I also wanna thank all of you for participating today um, you know, in our polls and, and offering all your insights and, and questions. Um, and remember again, for those who are in SC4X, Supply Chain Technology and Systems, today is the deadline to register for verification to get that certificate. Um, so I'd encourage you to do so if you haven't done so already, to do so after this event. Um, and again, thank you to Rao and to Shi Fong. I don't know if you have any last last thoughts, but thank you again for your time today. Thanks, Caleb. Good luck. Good luck to all of your students and all of your staff there. <laughs> yeah, thank you both and thank you everyone. Um, and take care.